This is episode 27 in a series called Spiritual Lessons from World War I. And so when you hear that you're uh, hearing episode 27, that should indicate that there are 26 other episodes leading up to this. So we are right smack in the middle of a grand story, and I would highly encourage those of you that have missed pieces to go back and hear them. But hopefully this can still stand alone and have its own unique uh, characteristics that would enable you to just listen in and enjoy it, even if you've missed the previous 26. I used to have a phrase uh, back when I was in uh, junior high, I, I would say, I think is when this was. It could have been early high school. Actually, I think it was. It was early high school. And uh, my brother sort of picked up on it too, and we both had it, and it was big, tough. Uh, so that was... Uh, uh, a phrase that I, I'm actually fairly familiar with. In fact, I was so familiar with it that my mom started charging me 25 cents every time she heard it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so it, it was called the, you know, the big tough tax. Uh, and so I, I ended up uh, changing it because, you know, you get in trouble, you lose all your money uh, pretty quickly when you're used to saying a phrase. So it turned into big uh, after a while, you know, because... And yeah, it actually morphed into how dumb uh, was actually what, but what, usually what ended up taking place is when I would see some guy strutting around and he thought he was all that, right? I would be like, big, tough. And then it became like, how dumb. And then my mom started charging me 50 cents for how dumb. Uh, so, th <laughs> so that became, hey. <laughs> it, it did. And actually, if you read the, the book that uh, I wrote called Evolution of the Pterodactyl, which is a very funny book. It goes through the evolution of big tough to how dumb to ha to ra, which turned into the pterodactyl. Ra! Uh, and uh, so that was, a, that was an entire evolutionary process. Uh, and it's a really funny one. But uh, so I couldn't resist. I actually told Leslie, I was like, should this be called Anzac Audacity? Should this be called the Laughing Soldier, the Tough Soldier? She goes, what about Big Tough? I was like, oh, I love it. That's great. <laughs> in, uh, in World War II, there is going to be a group called the Big Red One. And that's uh, the first division that's going to hit the beaches of Normandy in uh, Omaha, Omaha Beach. And it's a great legendary story. And there's going to be another group in World War I called the Anzac, uh, which is... If you're from Australia, New Zealand, you know what that is. If you're not from Australia, New Zealand, it's interesting how you don't know what it is. It's, it sounds like Aztec or it sounds like Prozac. You know, it's like uh, it sort of has this mixture. But to them, it would be the equivalent of something familiar with us in North America like G.I. Joe. Uh, it, it would be a term like grit. It would be a term like guts. It would be the Anzac. And so to them... It is a very, very significant thing, but I'd never even heard of it. Uh, we had someone uh, in our alumni summit, no, it was in our five-week semester that was here and asked me uh, you know, when, when I was going through World War I, it's like, so do you, you know about the Anzac? And you, know, you always want to sound smart when you're studying something and teaching on something, and I'm like, uh, the Anzac? It just sounded really odd to me. And... So, and for her, that was somewhat offensive that I hadn't heard of the Anzac, but I'm jokingly saying that. I don't think she was really offended. But that's what this is going to be. I do know about the Anzac, just I didn't know to call them that. And that's the Australian and New Zealand troops in World War I. But they were big, tough. So the history of Big Tough is what I just walked through. Uh, the toughest soldiers in the Bible. It's interesting because when you get to the idea of tough, uh, there's different definitions in every culture of what is tough. And I'm going to go through the Bible, and I'm just going to show you tough. So David sprinting towards Goliath. Jonathan, remember the son of Saul, when the Philistines uh, have them. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of Philistines. I mean, numberless, like the sand of the seashore. And the, the Israelites have no weapons. I mean, there's like two sets of weapons. Saul has some and Jonathan has some. And the men are panicking, giving way to fear. And Jonathan, with his armor bearer, goes and invades. It's a great story, and I know many of you know it, but that's, that's a tough soldier. Joshobium, it says that 
single-handedly, he took on a thousand Philistines. Okay, I'm going to call that big tough. Uh, Jehoshaphat, surrounded by three armies, is going to set his singers out in front and go into battle, knowing confidently that God is going to win the victory. Uh, Paul, which we could say he sang uh, in the time of battle as well, and uh, he rejoiced, uh, and again, he's going to do, uh, he's going to say rejoice, but remember when he was stoned? He's left for dead outside the city of Lystra and pops back up and then goes back in. Okay, now that is a soldier right there. Jesus, what did he do? He forgave. What we see is, it's a very different makeup than what most people would guess is a tough soldier, and yet the Bible is going to portray those in the military situation, in the darkest hour, how they behave. For perspective, the Anzac, in the same dark situation, laughed. And that's one of the qualities throughout history that is just sort of reverberated, which is why they're legendary. Because when you get into the darkest moments of your life, what do you do? How do you handle it? And God desires to build something in our souls that is strong in the day of testing. When you are prepared for a test, you smile at a test. When you are not prepared for a test, you dread a test. And you know, some of you were homeschooled, so you, don't, you never had the extraordinary privilege of having a test in school where you show up and the paper's set in front of you and you, you have you know, all sorts of physical sensations going through your body as you're engaging with this. Now, if you are well prepped, then you actually are excited for that moment. If you feel like you don't understand the subject, it's a dreadful moment. And if you've ever had this, that experience where you're really getting on top of a subject and you know it and you have the flashcards and you want to hand those flashcards to people and say, test me, test me, test me. How many of you in your Christian life are coming to God saying, test me? Because you actually feel like you have something. You have a grip on the truth. And when you have a grip on the truth, you recognize that you need to be tested. That it's the testing that is going to prove the reality of this in your life. But not many of us are at that point where we're saying, Lord, test me. <laughs> so I'm going to dedicate this message. I dedicated the rise of Poncho to one of our students, which was a very special moment for our own uh, beloved Poncho in the room. But uh, we have, I personally have, a lot of dear friends and a lot of graduates from Ellerslie, a lot of alumni from uh, New Zealand and Australia. And so I figured they would probably appreciate this. I have multiple ones that follow the World War I series in depth. They're waiting for the Anzac episode. So this is for all of you out there. Even though, sorry guys, the local ones, the ones that are here right now, none of you are from Australia and New Zealand as far as I know. So to all my dear friends in Australia and New Zealand, you know who you are, who demonstrate the Anzac audacity. Anzac. So this, is, this will make a lot more sense when you hear it because it's just a strange sounding word. But it's Australia, New Zealand, Army Corps. That's where it comes from. And so this group, it's interesting because at the time of World War I, uh, most of us have grown up, Australia, New Zealand are just countries. They've always existed. We never think anything about it. But in World War I, Australia has just been sort of recognized as a country, you know, come like 1901. New Zealand has just been recognized as a dominion. They went from a colony to a dominion in 1907. And so they're, they're sort of getting their game on. You know, people are starting to move in. They're starting to get a national identity. And then World War I strikes, and these two are going to be grouped together. And if you know New Zealand and Australia, they don't always get along. They're almost like a brother, two brothers, you know, where it's like they're in the same family, same neck of the woods, Right, but they have a tendency to make fun of one another. And Australia's, Australia and New Zealand, they both have a really good sense of humor. And uh, so they have a tendency to be rather caustic towards each other. But when it comes down to it and the bullets start flying, you've got yourself a mate uh, in each other. And it, it, was, it was just interesting in, in World War I how it bonded them, even though they still make fun of one another. Uh, but this Anzac 
uh, thing that took place because they're fighting together, side by side. They're mixed together. It's like the rest of the world is sort of like, oh, you guys are sort of one. We'll put you together. And uh, whether or not they liked it at first, they liked it in the end. So there's a question that's on the table, and that is, who were the toughest soldiers in World War I? And I wish I could source this, okay? And I, I can't, but here's what I remember being said, is that the toughest soldiers in World War I, now that's a subjective statement. I mean, you're, you're, it's someone's opinion, and you know, that person's opinion is only as good as you, know, you want to give it credence. However, here's what was said. The Australians were the toughest. The Kiwis or the New Zealanders were the second toughest. The Canadians were the third toughest. And the Americans, I don't really like being fourth, but, and the Americans <laughs> were the fourth. Okay, now, whoever came up with that list, I have no idea, right? But it's always stood out to me, and the reason why, I mean, these are fellow soldiers, like from other countries that are saying, oh, the Australians, the toughest soldier you'll ever meet. But then if you ask why, the answer is very interesting. Because when all hell breaks loose on their life, they laugh. And that, to every other soldier, is like, whoa. <laughs> and so it's legendary. It's from World War I on, there is something special about the makeup. Now, this is interesting because they've just been forged into a nation. And this is going to become an identity issue for them, where they're going to sort of carry on this. This is going to be a big deal for them. And it's all going to start April 25th of 1915. So World War I, 1915, we have a stalemate. Now, I've already gone into this, but some of you may not fully know it because you came in for the week-long training. But we have a Western Front that is formed. And it is like cement now. And the, neither side can get through. The Germans can't seem to break through the Western Front. But then uh, the allies can't seem to break through. Great Britain and France are just sort of stuck there. And they're just, lives are being gobbled up in this. I mean, millions of lives are being lost in this as both sides are trying to break this stalemate. And many generals or military tacticians are convinced that the only way to win the war is actually by breaking the Western Front, which is why they keep trying. It's like banging their head against a brick wall. And some have thought that if we could just break through in Russia, you know, Russia breaking through, and maybe we should throw weight, but they have a tough time getting a lot of weight up there because it's not that easy to get help to Russia. And so another thought is going to be presented, and there's going to be this cabal, this, this group of thinkers in the, especially the British government, that are going to be convinced that the way to win this war is through a different tactic, and they're called Easterners. And they, they believe that if they could come in from the bottom up, and I'll, I'll show you on a map what, what that means, but this is the key moment in history where they're going to try and solve a riddle. So I'm going to put sort of like a Western Front picture there. And you're going to see a line. Now, that's not, the line is actually jagged. It's not a straight line. But that's just my simple way of showing you. Through the very corner of Belgium down to Switzerland through France, you're going to see what's typically called the Western Front. And yet also, they've tried to go through the mountains of the Alps in Italy, and I mean, there's going to be battle after battle, and they just cannot get through. And then on the other side, you're going to sort of have this stalemate of a different sort in, of Russia trying to get through Germany and Austria-Hungary, and it's just like, how do we make this work? We can't seem to solve, and this is just, like I said, gobbling up lives by the millions. So both sides are desperate to create an avenue of change. And that's what's going to lead to uh, a different strategy. Oops. Uh, well, I, I call them the Easterners, but going after the soft underbelly of Germany, which is right down there by that green circle. If they feel that they can break through the Dardanelles and get to Constantinople, uh, that they feel like they could actually invade, and if they could destroy Turkey and get it out of the way, who's an ally to Germany, they feel like they can invade up through that soft underbelly. And this is going to be something known as the Gallipoli campaign, because that is the territory of Gallipoli right down there in that green circle. So what you see is I put a, an arrow there. I put a blue box around it, because the next map I'm going to give is going to zoom in on that territory, and you can see it a little clearer with a different map. And 
It's right where that red arrow is going to be. So I'm calling the Gallipoli campaign a great idea gone terribly wrong. So let's zoom in on, uh, on this. And so that's that same green circle. And you're going to see the Gallipoli Peninsula there, right? Sort of not in the middle of the green circle, but sort of. And you see Constantinople on the other side. So the goal is, you see that Great Britain has the most powerful navy in the world. And so, but it's just sitting in dock. They're not doing anything with it. And so Winston Churchill, who is over the Navy, is like, we must use this. And a lot of the admirals are like, but these are our precious boats. We don't want to lose them. It's like, what is the good of a boat if it's not going to be spent? And so that's a tension uh, in the military at that time because it costs, you know, it would be the equivalent of like hundreds of millions to build one of these battleships. And they're just going to like send them off. And yet, what's the good of having hundreds of millions in a ship if you don't use it when it is most needed? And so what they want to do is break through that, uh, those channels. It's called the Dardanelles. You can see, sort of see the word Dardanelle there underneath the green line. But it's, it's right in, you know, between that Gallipoli Peninsula and Turkey. And they want to break through. It's called forcing the straits. And they believe that they can do that with their battleships. However, the key is going to be surprise. They want to do this when Turkey doesn't know they're coming. And so totally shock them, break through, take Constantinople. It's a great idea, actually. Every time I've ever heard the idea, it's like, it makes total sense. Stalemates on both sides, or at least let's be creative. Let's come up with a different uh, way of dealing with this. The problem is, the admirals are so afraid of losing their boats that when they start pulling into this territory, they start hitting some mines and <laughs> they blow up. And we have some bad weather. By the time that they actually try and do this, Turkey knows exactly that they're there. Okay, so it is a, this is one of those colossal disasters where Winston Churchill is pulling the little hair he has out, right? It is, it's just a disaster. It's going to ruin Winston Churchill's career actually up to this point. So this is World War I. He's going to become a hero in World War II, but before he became a hero in World War II, he was the goat. He was the fall guy, and he was the, the big mistake, and this is where it's all going to happen. So that little area, you're going to see a peninsula, even though it's sort of hard, and I'm going to zoom in on that blue block there so you can see it a little closer. And so there's that blue block, and you're going to see what's called the Dardanelles, and it's between Turkey, which is to the right of the screen, and that little peninsula, and uh, that's what they're going to try and shoot their, uh, so it's called forcing the Dardanelles demands the element of surprise, which they're going to blow and it's, it's not going to work. And so they're going to try and go right where I have that red circle there through it. And it's just, I mean, they have landmines. And so you just imagine, not a landmine, a sea mine. I don't know exactly if that's the right term for it. But imagine spending hundreds of millions on a boat and having all your men on it and having a little cheap mine blow it up. And so as a result, you're going to see the hesitancy of the Navy to risk another hundred million just to try and break through here. But that hesitancy is going to cost them. And meanwhile, all the Turkish uh, defenses are going to rush to the situation and totally clamp down, which is going to change the strategy. And so as a result, the Allies are going to, instead of try and break through the Dardanelles, they're going to actually land on the beaches of that peninsula and try and cross land with infantry. Well, it sounds really good on paper, but they, no one had a correct map of what this looked like. It's like cliffs. And it's like, do you recognize what you're getting yourself into? The answer would be no, they did not. So this is that colossal disaster. And you're going to, uh, I, can, I can just put a block around it there. That blue block is going to show you, it says Anzac. So the Australia, Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, Anzac, this is their first showing in World War I. So they get the privilege, you know, they're sent off with a parade, and then they travel to Egypt, and now they're being deployed. And they're going into action. And they get into their boats, and they're going to be crossing in the, in the black of night. And they can't see where they're going. And they're going to end up not where they're supposed to be. And this is how they start. This is like their first experience. Okay, welcome to World War, uh, Australia and New Zealand. Now that you're a nation and you can have an identity, what do your soldiers fight like? And this is their first opportunity to do something, which is why it's remembered very uh, fondly uh, in Australia and New Zealand. So we're going to zoom in on that blue block that I had. 
And you're gonna see, it's a sort of a hard thing, but I'm gonna put arrows on the screen. Those two arrows show where they were supposed to land, okay? There were two spots they were supposed to land. They didn't land where they were supposed to land. They landed there, okay? And it's gonna be historically called Anzac Cove. And so it's sort of like uh, a fish barrel. And they're gonna walk into it, and these cliffs up above are going to have all the Turkish soldiers with their guns aimed down at the landing soldiers. Again, welcome <coughs> to the World War, Australia and New Zealand. It is the worst of situations you could ever imagine. When they're stepping off the boats, there are fish in a barrel. And the Turkish soldiers are really enjoying how fun this is. So the Anzacs, uh, we're gonna call this the baptism of fire for an entire nation. There's nothing quite like the proving of a nation. It's proved right here. It's like, so what, what are you guys made of? And when they enter into that situation, now some of this you don't always know, you know, if it's legend and then it's stretched and then it's hyperbolized and it's grown. At the same time, it's a spiritual truth, even if that was the case. It's a spiritual truth for our soul. Because we are being recruited. We are being brought into a battle. And when we step in, it doesn't always <clears throat> go the way we thought it should. Sometimes we end up in Anzac Cove. And yet, what is going to come out of you? David sprinted. Jonathan invaded. Jehoshaphat set his singers out in front. Joshobium defied. There's all sorts of incredible examples in Scripture. You know, Paul the Apostle and uh, Sil Silas are going to sing in their prison cell. There's loads of people that sang. So many uh, men and women that were fed to wild beasts in the arena under Nero's reign would walk into the arena singing with their hands raised, smiles on their faces. How do you face your Anzac Cove? Because in a sense, it proves something in your soul, just like this is going to prove a nation. A nation, in a sense, they're going to be so proud of their men. Now, well, here's what's interesting. They lost in this situation. There is, it's the weirdest thing, because why would you brag about that? But it's because of how they entered it. It's because of how they fought in an impossible situation. There's no way to really win this situation, but in a strange way, they win. They win. They become legends in this because of how they laugh because of how they face it with a smile. It's like, oh, so we got the odds against us. Yeah, that's the way we like it in Australia. And that attitude, you have to admit, is extremely attractive to all of us as humans. It's like, I could use a little of that. We could use a little of the Anzac in all of us. The spiritual life demands it. And so when you take life too seriously and you end up in Anzac Cove and you immediately start crying and going way to, giving way to self-pity and muttering and grumbling and complaining, your life is defeated. But when you land in Anzac Cove and you start rejoicing and you laugh and you smile and you use the classic military line, men, we've got them right where we want them. I mean, there's so many great generals that have used a line similar to that in the worst moments because that's what the soldiers need. They actually need to elevate their thinking. They need to laugh in a moment like this. So there's a picture, isn't that a cool picture, of the Anzac uh, Regiment going over to the island, uh, to the peninsula early that morning. The failed landing in Anzac Cove, it wasn't called Anzac Cove, it became known as Anzac Cove, April 25th, 1915. So this is from the Anzac War Museum. Leaving the ships, the Australians were towed in boats and then rowed the final distance to the beach. In the darkness, the boats landed in the wrong positions. Once off the beach, the men faced high cliffs, high hills, cliffs, and ravines. The terrain was not what they had been told to expect. As the day went on, it became evident the task was impossible. So this is Private John Gordon of the 9th Battalion. He said, at last the day ended, and I can tell you I have never spent nor wished to spend such a long day again. The sights one saw will remain impressed on my memory as long as I live. So many of the Anzac are going to be mowed down and, and killed in this situation. I mean, it's a total disaster. And yet... 
the hardiness of these troops is not going to be dimmed. So here's General Ian Hamilton. He's British, and he's over this entire operation. And this is uh, the statement he makes. At whose door will history leave the blame for the helpless, hopeless fix we are left in? That's the way they all felt. And of course, this is the first, I mean, at least the British had tasted of battle before this. The Australians and New Zealanders had, hadn't tasted anything. This is their first experience, and it's a total disaster. Like shooting fish in a barrel. That is, the, uh, that is a phrase that is synonymous, synonymous with easy. It's like, oh, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. This is easy. And that's the way it is for the Turks. And unfortunately, the fish in the barrel are the Anzac. And they're just down there in the base of a cove with these high cliffs around them. And they're not in the high ground. That's the opposite of, of what you would ever want in a military situation. So here's a question for all of us. What do you do when you get handed a basket, it says bast, but it's supposed to be basket, of lemons? Now, you guys know the answer to that, right? Uh, you know, the, the proverbial statement when you get uh, a lemon, make lemonade. And yet, when you get a basket of lemons, does it change anything? Does it alter? You know, it's like you just have more lemonade. That, that's, the, that's the principle is how a Christian sees it. It's like if you get one lemon, yeah, you only get one cup full, you know, maybe even a half a cup. You know, it's not even that much. However, you can still convert that sour situation into something sweet depending on how you approach it. But if you've got a whole basket, a whole cove full of lemons, what are you going to do with it? Make a lot of lemonade. And that's a principle for your life that if you can grasp it, will transform your existence on this earth. There are going to be many Anzac coves. There are going to be many moments where you don't land where you thought you were going to land. And there are going to be situations that seem very hopeless. And why is it that the enemy seems to have the high ground and you seem to be uh, in, on the beach below? And yet, what you do in that moment actually defines so much of your character. Your character shines in and through difficulty. One of the, one of the principles, my, my uncle used to have a, a statement, and then he said, you know, before I hire someone, I take them golfing. And because golfing is frustrating. And so he wants to watch that person. He's just talking with them. You know, but he's going to watch them as they miss the ball or as they hit up a big chunk of grass, as their ball goes into a lake, as, they, as the ball goes into the sand trap, and he's just going to watch them. And how they handle that sand trap, how they handle that lake, how they handle that big divot is actually what he's looking for. He's not looking if they get a hole in one. That's not what he's interested in. You know, he's interested in how they handle the adversity. Because adversity demonstrates something in who you are, about who you are. The same is true with the military. In the start of World War I, they have a whole bunch of high-level generals in the French uh, military system that have been teaching in the military colleges. And they're very learned. They know military history. But then you stick them on the ground to run uh, a military campaign and bombs start flying and blood starts dripping and guess what? They start melting and they get fearful. And he's like uh, Joseph Joffre, who was the uh, commander in chief of the French forces, is going to do something unprecedented in the first month of war. He's going to fire most of the generals of the entire military and he's going to put in men of action. Men that may not have as much smarts but men who, when you put them in Anzac Cove, fight like men. And he says, that's who I want leading the men. I want men who believe that we're going to win this. I want men who laugh, not men who run from the battle with their tail between their legs. And so what I want to say is, for each of us, we all have the propensity to run from battle with our tail between our legs. That's human, right? Especially when you're in Anzac Cove. However, you've been given something. You've been given something very, very special. It's called the grace of God. You've been given something that actually causes you or enables you, if you will receive it, to actually function at a higher level in that very moment. So what do you do when you get handed a basket of lemons? You smile and you say, hey guys, let's set up the lemonade stand. We've got some good stuff to make. 
So here's a poem about the Anzac by A.B. Banjo. I don't know if it's Patterson or Paterson. The metal that a race can show is proved with shot and steel. And now we know what nations know and feel what nations feel. So that's probably an Australian, it could have been a New Zealander, saying, now we know what it's like to be a nation. We understand what it's like to sacrifice our few men for something that we believe in. And they were proven in and through what took place in Anzac Cove. Turning disaster and loss into something memorable. The art of flipping the situation. So I talk about flipping the situation a lot. There's, in every situation, you could look at it from the devil's vantage point because that's the way he wants. He's like, he even hands you the glasses, like free pair of glasses, free pair of glasses. And if you put on those glasses, you see doom. You see something that is depressing. The enemy's always pushing down. Despair, depression, discouragement. He's always pushing down. You need to take off those glasses, throw them to the side, and put on God's perspective, his glasses. It's called a phreneo. In Philippians, it's the attitude or the mind of Christ. It's like glasses. It's a perspective, a paradigm through which you look at things. And if you put on God's glasses, it's like, hey, we're going to win this thing. Hey, this is going to be good for my soul. Hey, I'm going to grow stronger through this. Yeah. And as a result, when you put on his perspective, you can triumph in the situation. And it's the form of flipping any circumstance. The Australians and the New Zealanders are going to enter into an impossible situation. Ironically, over 100 years later, everyone in their nation still looks at it as an incredible moment in their history. Like, they're proud of it. They're happy about it. It's not that they're happy that they lost men. It's not that they're happy, but they cherish the loss of those men. Those men are celebrated. It's just very interesting to see how you can take something that is very sour and make it sweet. And yet the entire Christian life is enunciated that way. Some of you have sour things in your life right now. And yet if you take the devil's glasses and put them on, oh, wow, yeah, that could be very discouraging. Oh, wow, I could understand why self-pity makes a total, uh, you know, has a good case right now. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can understand why maybe a bit of depression, a bit of discouragement uh, would be welcome in this situation. Take those glasses off and throw them aside. This is your opportunity. This is your Anzac Cove. And even more than 100 years from now, it can be remembered how you faced this situation. This is a defining moment for your soul, for your life. And it is, it is showcasing truly what is inside of you. And if all you have is you know, your natural man oomph, then what's going to come out is natural man oomph. But if you have the grace of God, what comes out is Jesus. What comes out is startling to the world around you. So Streams in the Desert, which is probably, it's arguably my favorite devotion. Devotional. So I, you know, I have Logos software, and on it it has three different devotionals every day. One is My Atmosphere is Highest. One is uh, Morning and Evening with Charles Spurgeon. And then streams in the desert. Streams in the desert is just, it, it's like Mrs. Charles B. Kalman, which is what she calls herself. Her name was Letty Kalman. But she seems to have suffered a lot in her life. And so streams in the desert is sort of like, yeah, I walked through a desert too, but let me show you the stream in the midst of it. And it is so encouraging. And you know, when you, I, I feel like the book was written for me. Uh, but I think it's written for anyone that just walks the narrow way. Anyone who goes through a tremendous suffering, a tremendous challenge in their life, when they read through this, it's just like gives words to things. And it's constantly turning your gaze heavenward as opposed to sticking on the earthly glasses, which would lead to complaint. So this is the sort of thing. If you've never read Streams in the Desert, this will be a good introduction to you. This is like everyday type of stuff. But this is just an excerpt. Temptation is necessary to settle and confirm us in the spiritual life. It is like the fire which burns in the colors of a mineral painting, or like the winds that cause the mighty cedars of the mountain to strike more deeply into the soil. Our spiritual conflicts are among our choicest blessings, and our great adversary is used to train us for his ultimate defeat. Okay, now guys, that line 
is so good that I'm going to read it again. And I might even read it three times. It is so good. But I want you to see if you can hear this. Our spiritual conflicts are among our choicest blessings. And our great adversary, the devil, is used to train us for his ultimate defeat. That is an incredible statement. The devil's going down. And so if he's making all this nonsense, then God's going to leverage that. And it's going to strengthen you so that you can ultimately overcome him. It's not interesting that even what the enemy is doing is actually making you stronger to overcome him. The ancient Phrygians had a legend that every time they conquered an enemy, the victor absorbed the physical strength of his victim and added so much more to his own strength and valor. So temptation victoriously met doubles our spiritual strength and equipment. Okay, I need to read that again because some of you didn't fully appreciate it. So temptation victoriously met doubles our spiritual strength and equipment. It is possible for us in our spiritual life through the victorious grace of God to turn to account the things that seem most unfriendly and unfavorable and to be able to say continually, the things that were against me have happened to the furtherance of the gospel. When you enter into your Anzac Cove, it's sometimes hard in the moment when you're mad at your general for leading you here. It's like, excuse me? Uh, why are we here? This isn't where we were supposed to be. And the bullets are flying and your, and your friends are falling around you. It's sometimes hard to get clear perspective in that. But what you want as a believer is to be very quick to go after the truth and to make sure that under your footing, under your standing, so the word understanding, what's under your standing, what is the rock beneath your feet is clear in that moment. God is in control right now. He has not left me. He has not forsaken me. He is a very present help in time of trouble. I've got myself a time of trouble. But I also have God right here with me. He is very present right now. And the things that were against me have happened to the furtherance of the gospel. You could even say the things that are against me right now will happen to the furtherance of the gospel through my life, through this circumstance. I know God is progressing his kingdom it's, he's not being thwarted. His purpose in my life is not being thwarted just because I'm in Anzac Cove right now. But he's actually going to expand. He's going to stretch forth his purposes even further through this. See why we can laugh? See why we can smile? 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. In this you greatly rejoice. Okay, you arrive in Anzac Cove and then Peter comes up to you and pats you on the back. It was one of those thumps. And he says, in this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, you're a fish in a barrel, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is actually something to rejoice in. James 1, 2 through 4, my brethren, as you arrive in Anzac Cove, it doesn't say that in scripture, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. When you embrace your Anzac Cove, you grow 10 feet taller. It's interesting, just in hindsight, looking back at World War I and, and seeing these Australian, these Anzac troops, and recognizing the esteem that the rest of the fighting soldiers throughout the world are going to have for them because of how they walked into that situation. And, you know, as a believer, that's the sort of impact I want to have with my life that all the other fighting men in the world could be inspired by how I handle my Anzac Cove. And that's precisely what happens. There's a ripple effect when you walk into that with faith, with confidence that even this situation is held by God, that he is in control even of this, even though it feels so out of control, that God will work through that to impact not just the other troops, you know, the rest of the church, 
but even to startle the world around, to cause them to wonder what it is that you possess. So a great quote to use in your life. So when we were going through the alumni summit, I brought up this same quote. It's a good quote, and it's sort of inspired by uh, uh, Richard Wormbrandt in his uh, article that he wrote called uh, Preparing for Persecution. And where he talks about walking into a grocery store in the United States and where we have so many options. And he deliberately goes in to the grocery store to not buy something. And to walk through the grocery store and to say, I can live without that. I can live without that. I can live without that. And most of us have never thought of going through a grocery store that way, right? And yet, it, there's a similar principle in us that when you think of the trials that are just there, or maybe in someone else's life, the things that could be before us, that you can point at it with a spiritual finger and say, I have grace for that. 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 It actually doesn't matter what Anzac Cove you end up landing in. The grace of God will prove sufficient. Now what's interesting is you don't, you have the grace, but you don't yet have it in your grip yet because you receive that grace when you end up in Anzac Cove. When you're in Anzac Cove, you have grace for Anzac Cove. I remember my sister when she was, I think like 31, 32, was asked the question, Chrissy, are you called to singleness? You know, she's single and you know, Eric's happily married now, her younger brother. And you know, those are sensitive topics and you don't really like that question. But my sister's answer was amazing. Today I am. Uh, today I'm called to singleness. Uh, but that doesn't mean tomorrow I am. Uh, and in other words, she recognized that she has grace for today. And if you're single today, what do you have grace for? Singleness. You have grace for singleness today because you're single. And if you're married tomorrow, which some of you are like, praise God, I can't wait for that. <laughs> but if you're married tomorrow, guess what you have grace for? For marriage. You see, you have grace for your if I call it a challenge, that doesn't sound very good, does it? You have grace for your challenge called marriage or singleness. Both of them, children, are a challenge, right? Dogs can be a challenge. <laughs> However, there's, there's also a beauty in it. And in every challenge, there is that beauty. Marriage, you know, if I was going to summarize marriage, marriage is the greatest thing, you know, is, that has probably ever struck my life. It's hard to say that it's greater than kids, but they both are very close, you know, first and second. And yet they're also the greatest challenges I've ever walked through. I need grace for them. And yet out of that challenge has come such beauty in my life. Every Anzac Cove is similar, that you could look at it just with the lens of humanity and just throw up your hands and say, this is a terrible situation. I will never rejoice in this. I cannot say thank you, God, for that. And yet, you could. Any moment, you remember when uh, Corey and Betsy Tenboom arrived at Ravensbrook concentration camp? I mean, not the most pleasant place to be, right? And they're stuck in barracks 28, and it's full of fleas. And they're stuck on one bunk together. They have one pillow together, and women are being killed, uh, you know, gas chamber, you know, killed every day around them, beaten, uh, kicked with steel-toed boots. They're being yelled at and screamed at. It's just like demonic zone that they're in. And yet, the first thing that uh, Betsy said is, uh, Corey, let's give thanks to God. And Corey's like, what in the, what? give thanks? How could we give thanks in this situation? Well, because God says give thanks in all things. Yeah, but there has to be exceptions to that, and this seems like a pretty good one. And so Betsy started, thank you, Lord, that Corey and I are together. And then Corey joins in. Thank you, Lord, that somehow our Bible got through the inspection. Supernatural. They had a Bible with them. And Betsy thank, says, thank you, Lord, that we have our vitamin bottle. Their vitamin bottle, too, got through. They have a vitamin bottle that is never going to run out of vitamins, and they're sharing it with all the women the whole time. It's never going to run out. I mean, it's an extraordinary story, right? Thank you that we have a vitamin bottle. And then Corey didn't know what to add. So Betsy adds one more. It's like, thank you, Lord, for the fleas. And Betsy refused to thank God for the fleas. I cannot thank God for the fleas. 
and, and Betsy, you know, Betsy's portrayed by Corey as being this angelic character, right? She never made a mistake. And, but Betsy is going to, you know, say, Corey, Corey, all things. And let's even thank him for the fleas. I mean, how could you thank God for fleas? But if you guys know the story, it's amazing because Corey is going to thank God for the fleas. Every night they're going to have a Bible study in Barracks 28. And the guards will not come in. Why? Because of the fleas. The re- those fleas are going to be a barrier where none of the guards want to have anything to do with Barracks 28 because it is infested with fleas. And those fleas are going to create a barricade for the gospel to come forth in the midst of one of the darkest places in all of the world. When you walk into your Anzac Cove, rejoice. Give thanks. God possesses even this place. He is in control. And he will bring beauty out of what looks right now as ash. So you can walk through your life and say, I have grace for that. I have grace for that, for that, and even that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I, I can be led into any Anzac Cove because I have, I have Christ with me. That's the concept. You know, there is nothing that I can face that God is not superior to it. His grace is not greater than the challenge that I will face. And so when you understand that, you can embrace the challenges in your life with a whole different uh, vigor. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in peace and cast away their cords from us. Oh no, the son of God, this is a foreshadow, is going to end up in an Anzac Cove. It's called the cross. Oh, it's a very dark situation, guys. The kings of the earth, I mean, they're, he's surrounded. It's like he's on the beach and the, every, the enemy seems to have the high ground, mocking, ridiculing, you know, firing his bullets. <clears throat> he who sits in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall hold them in derision. Who's in control in that situation? You see, if the enemy knew what he was doing, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I mean, if he really knew what he was stepping into, he wouldn't have messed with it. You see, God is in control. Even in what looks like disaster, it's your job to laugh along with him. So a great quote from C.T. Studd, if God who sits in the heavens can laugh, his children on earth should be loyal enough to do the same. When the bullets are flying, when you're in the fish barrel, and it doesn't seem like you have a lot of options here, that's one option that I want you to consider right at the top laugh. It's a laugh of faith. It's the equivalent of a song. Pull a David and sprint. Pull a Jonathan and invade. Pull a Joshobium and defy. Pull a Jehoshaphat and set your singers out in front of you. Pull a Jesus and forgive. Pull a Paul the Apostle and get back up and go right back into Lystra. In other words, where you handle it in a way that is totally different than the world because they don't have the grace for these challenges. You do. You have something the world cannot touch, but you can share it by living it out. How can we laugh in such dire circumstances? Wouldn't it make more sense to cry? Romans 8, 28 is the answer, and we all know this answer, and we all have memorized this scripture. This is one of the most commonly memorized scriptures in the Bible, and yet very few of us actually remember it when it's needed most. We know that all things, including Anzac Cove and a mislanding in Anzac Cove, work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. God takes all things and works them for good, even the things the devil has his finger in and his nonsense that he's working. Joseph had this perspective. When his brothers come in, he says, I know you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You see, God takes even the enemy's chicanery, his nonsense, his malfeasance, and he converts it. He turns it into something good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. You need to know that the moment your foot steps on Anzac Cove, 
The beach right there, once you hit that hot sand, you have a confidence, even though the situation looks bleak, even this will be turned for good. Even this. Because he loves me and he's he's called me according to his purpose. So therefore, I can rest by faith knowing that even this is going to be a part of his plan. The laughter of the Anzac, it can still be heard today. So Charles Bean, in in rehearsing the history, they're going to arrive on that beach April 25th, 1915. They're going to leave on December 20th. So that's, that's a long journey of eight months, right, of being in this miserable situation. It's one of the most miserable eight months you could ever imagine. By dawn on December 20th, Anzac had faded into a dim blue line, lost amid other hills on the horizon as the ships took their human freight to Imbros, Lemnos, and Egypt. But Anzac stood and still stands for reckless valor in a good cause, for enterprise, resourcefulness, fidelity, comradeship, and endurance that will never own defeat. I, I've always enjoyed that attitude. It never owns defeat. You know, there's no, there's no defeat here. No, we weren't defeated. It doesn't own defeat. That's actually a very Christian concept. We're not defeated. The enemy's the one that's going to lose. Even though in the moment you could say, well, you lost all your money, you lost your right arm, you know, you lost this and this and this, yeah, but I didn't lose the war. This thing is still going to win. The allies are going to win this thing, right? And, and so as a result, you need to know your place in something bigger, that technically you don't own defeat. One of my favorite quotes is Josephus talking about Moses at the Red Sea. So he's giving what we know is a biblical story in the book of Exodus, he's going to describe it as Jewish history. And he's going to basically say that Moses despised all dangers. He despised them. And that he knew that God possessed that situation. That situation, which looked terrible, the strongest military force in the world known as the Egyptians were mad. And they had every bit of their strength coming against them. And the, the uh, Israelites had no weapons. They had their women and children with them, and they're backed up to a sea. They have mountains on both sides. And Moses is totally confident that God has led them there, and he will deliver them. And he had three options. He said God could either flatten the mountains, he could part this sea, this is according to Josephus, and we could walk across on dry land, or we could fly out of here. If God has brought us here, he also has a solution. And I've always just marveled at that. Do I think that way when I am brought into an Anzac Cove? That this is God's territory. That he's smiling right now. He's laughing right now. Why don't I join him? As opposed to go into self-pity mode. And so as a result, God knows I'm here. And he can address this situation any way he wishes. And he's powerful enough. He can flatten mountains. He can part a Red Sea and we could walk across on dry land, which those of you that know the story, that's exactly what he did. Or we could fly out of here, which of course some of you are thinking, which one would have been the most enjoyable to, <laughs> to have in history? I mean, I'm really glad we got the, you know, the, the, the dry ground through the sea. I mean, that's a pretty cool story, but having that entire nation fly out of there, you have to admit that would have been pretty cool. So what does Anzac mean? So here's Eric Ludy's definition. It means big, tough. (laughs) But here's the the official definition. Uh, Arthur Bork says, Anzac is a powerful, they actually use it as a word, Anzac. It's like the Anzac legend, the Anzac spirit, that the Australians and the New Zealanders, they have something. Just like the French would call it cran, they have guts, or we in America would call it grit. They have, they have Anzac. It's a powerful driving sensation that can only be felt. It is a feeling that burns in the heart of every Australian and New Zealand countryman. A warm, tender, fiery, even melancholy ideal that nurtures intense patriotism in the innermost soul of everybody. You know, the church is meant to have something like this. It is something that we possess. It is a fervor, a love, It is a comradeship that we share, an affection one for another. In fact, you know his disciples because of that, our love for one another, and that we stand together, and in the darkest moments, we smile. 
we laugh, we sing songs together. Okay, guys, let's start singing our song as we're surrounded, as they, as they begin to burn the building that we're in to kill us because they want to rid us. You know, they want to get this world free of our, you know, disease. And so they light the building on fire, and inside, what is happening to the Christians? They're not screaming. They're not yelling. They're not panicking. They're singing. What is that? That's Christianity. It always has been Christianity. We do not fear. If we are going to be burned, what do we know? We're going home. And I can say, along with Paul, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And so no matter what the enemy does, we are ready and poised to do some serious laughing. King George V is going to say this, uh, I heartily congratulate you upon the splendid conduct and bravery displayed by the Australian troops in the operations at the Dardanelles, who have indeed proved themselves worthy sons of the empire. I, so the only reason I finished with that is I just picture King Jesus, who's a lot greater than King George V. <laughs> but this is what he delights in. The courage that we show in the Dardanelles when we go into Anzac Cove. And more than anything, I think all of us would agree what we want is not a medal, not an iron cross, not a badge of courage, but the words, well done, my good and faithful servant, from our commander-in-chief, from our king in heaven upon our arrival. That's our dream. And this is what we are designed for. We are built to thrive in Anzac Cove. Father, I ask that you would prep our inner man, that you would groom us after this pattern, not the pattern of chintzy Christianity of our age, but the pattern of the classic, narrow way, ancient path version. We want the gospel that Paul preached. We want the life that Paul lived, where Christ dwelt in him and he rejoiced in all things. We want the version of Christianity that sings songs in prison cells, that turns outward and ministers to the prison guard, that we're not so focused on ourselves, but that we're ready to pour out our life for Jesus Christ. Make us tough soldiers the way you intend us to be, Lord. Ready to love, ready to serve, ready to even die with a smile and a song on our soul. We love you. It's in the precious name we pray, amen.